Next article. Did you see this one? Tyson Foods, the CFO, was arrested after getting drunk, breaking into a home and falling asleep in a random woman's bed. The chief financial officer of Tyson Foods and the son of the company's chairman was arrested in Arkansas over the weekend after he entered a random woman home, woman's home while intoxicated and fell asleep in her bed, according to police. John Tyson was found asleep at the home in the 400 block of North Mock Avenue. Isn't that ironic? In Fayetteville on Sunday at 2.05 a.m., according to the preliminary arrest report, Tyson's headquarters is located in Springdale, about 10 miles northeast of Fayetteville. College-aged woman who lived in the home called police about a potential burglary, saying she believed she left the front door unlocked and returned home to find a male she did not know asleep in her bed. An officer entered the home and found Tyson's closing on the floor and identified him by an ID found in his wallet. The officer woke Tyson up and he sat up in bed but did not verbally respond. After briefly sitting up, he laid back down and attempted to go back to sleep. The officer said there was an odor of an intoxicants coming from his breath and body, and his movements were sluggish and uncoordinated. Now, I want to be like we've all been there. We've all been there. We've all been the CFO of a you know Fortune 500 company in the United States at 32 years old. And been like, you know, I'm out drinking with the fellas and we're just going to go crash at some lady's house that we don't even know where we are. Like, I'm sure Tyson does all these things for the communities they serve. You know, I'm sure that I'm sure that they've got every single uh, talking point and perfect coverage, so that you'd never raise an eye to the the hubris and the power of massive international corporations. This fellow should lose his job. He won't. And if he does lose his job, he'll get another job that pays just as much. He'll just change the name. It's very interesting, you know, as I, as I, as I, like, as I go along, uh, I'm a, I'm pro business. I'm pro capitalism. Um, I don't really like, you know, company boycotts, organized boycotts. I think that, I call, they used to call it green turfing, green mail. This this is unacceptable. There's people going to work tomorrow that are going to chop, literally chop the heads off of chickens, okay? And they're going to be on a line with other people that are going to do the exact same thing, and that's all they do every day is they process chicken, okay? And then you have this guy who, you know, who knows what he does. He's probably not on the on the floor processing chicken, and it's somehow okay for him to uh, to do this. And then you say, "Well, not John. Nobody's saying it's okay. Why does he still have a job?" You say, "Well, everybody makes mistakes, John. Yeah, but you know what? I've gotten to the point where if you're going to pay people all this money, they can't make mistakes." When you have all this money, when you have all this opportunity, when you have all this given to you, handed to you, and you still screw up? No. No. Now, does it matter what I think? No. I mean, it doesn't. It's not going to change anything. But I've gotten to the point where this behavior isn't going to work for me. It's just not. It's not okay. Moving on, I thought we could check Deerwood Realty. What do we got here? 7.25%, 30-year fixed. That's not good. I'd like to be at five and a half. You say, John, well, aren't you, aren't you worried about fighting inflation? Absolutely. Absolutely. I really do believe, and I, I really do believe the, the Fed um, 
seems to always be late to the party. Like in January, I was saying, hey, you got issues. I always think they're a little bit too late. To, and then they then they then they move past the goal line way too fast. So, you know, targeted rate hikes totally fine, but slow them down. Slow them down. It takes time for these rate cuts to filter through the economy. I mean, when you're doing 75 basis points a month, dicey. Moving on. I don't even know. I don't even know what this stuff is. We're getting rid of it. Jason Luris, here's what we know about the top I buyers in Phoenix. They cl hold close to 1 billion homes right now. If they sold their active inventory today, they would lock in $100 million in losses. They're slashing prices by 2% every 14 days, about. Demand is dried up at the current rates. This could get ugly. Not good. I buyers very odd. They were buying houses that were more like they were paying more than other people would buy, you know, would pay for the house. And then they're putting them online and they were odd. It was an odd deal. I think I buyers are going to eat it. I don't wish that upon anyone. I just don't see it being very, uh, very good for them in the future. Moving on. Aaron Lehman, for those, uh, so this is from Realtor.com Economics, says prices would have to drop significantly for home buyers to feel like they're actually getting a bargain. Even a 10% decline in prices is not going to offer that much of a bargain. It says for those payments to return to where they were just one year ago, home prices would need to plummet by 45%, assuming rates stay where they are. If mortgage rates increase to 8%, prices would have to fall by 50% to get back to around last year's payment. It's not good. Not good at all. Just putting it out there. Lance Lambert, Goldman Sachs's forecast model also predicts, I would say, March 2024, that's when Goldman Sachs's forecast models predict U.S. home prices are poised to bottom out. March of 2024, so that's not this Upcoming March, that's the next March. It says peak to trough of that model is negative 7.6%. The forecast model also predicts that the U.S. home price will enter 2026 below June 2022's peak. So if you're thinking about buying a house and staying there for the next five years, you may be in a situation where you didn't really make anything on your home, which is okay. At least you didn't lose. It's my opinion. The Kobiesi letter, recent developments, housing market falling at its fastest pace since 2011. Widespread layoffs at tech companies. Credit card debt, an all-time high of $930 billion. 37% of U.S. small businesses can't pay rent. And mortgage, demand, mortgage demand is at a 25-year low. The recession is worsening. Now, some people are saying that that's not true. Things are okay. Things are going to be better. I hope so. Ryan Lundquist, this is more talk on iBuyers. Market change hasn't been easy for iBuyers. Here are the open doors active listing in the Sacramento region. 76% of units are listed below their acquisition price. Blatant carnage, though listed below, doesn't automatically mean loss since they likely had a 5% credit from the owner. I don't know enough about the credits to uh, you know I don't know about the credit system. I just know that i buyers are silly and they acted silly. Kira Mason, she's a real estate agent, I think in Pittsburgh or Philadelphia. 
Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love, I think. The 2836 rule says you shouldn't spend more than 28% of your gross monthly income on housing and no more than 36% on total debts. Today, it takes 39% of the median national household income to pay the mortgage on an average price home, highest share since 1984. That can't go on forever. Housing bubble disrespect for the real estate story of 2023 to 2026 will be that of falling household formation, resulting in higher rental vacancy rates, resulting in massive foreclosure and financial ruin for a large portion of the real estate investor world. Mom and Pops hits, Pops hits hardest, followed by newbie syndicates. I don't know that that's true. I mean, how do you, how do you, I mean, if you're a large corporate, if you're like Open Door or if you're like Zillow iBuyer who, who literally went out of business, is that, are you the ones hit hardest by it? You know, I mean, had, had a buyer or had a, yeah, had a buyer ask me about this. Wells Fargo mortgage staff brace for layoffs as U.S. loan volumes collapse. Now, Wells Fargo said they don't want to be the number one home lender in the United States anymore. They're they're trying to stay away from that business. I'm not going to read the points on CNBC because you know what I think. Mortgage volumes at U.S. or Wells Fargo slowed further in recent weeks, leaving some workers idle and sparking concerns. The lender will need to cut more employees as the U.S. housing slump deepens. The bank had about 18,000 loans in its retail origination pipeline in the early weeks of the fourth quarter, according to people with knowledge of the company's figures. That's down as much as 90% from a year earlier when the COVID pandemic field housing boom was in full swing, said the people who declined to be identified, speaking about internal matters. It says the U.S. housing market has been a roller coaster in recent years, taking off in 2020 thanks to the easy money policies and the adoption of remote work. And slowing down this year as the Fed Reserve boasted rates, home buyers have been squeezed, and the pace of refinancing has plummeted as borrowing costs surged more than 7% for a 30-year loan from about 3% a year earlier. And rates may climb further as the Fed is expected to boot its benchmark rate against again Wednesday. They did. This is an older article. Um, the situation has pressured the home loan industry, per, per, particularly firms like Rocket Mortgage that thrived on, thrived on loan refinancing and is expected to lead to consolidation among newer non-bank players that rush <laughs> to serve customers after most U.S. banks receded from the market. Among the six biggest U.S. banks, Wells Fargo has historically been the most reliant on mortgages, but that has begun to change under CEO Charlie Scharf, who has said the bank is looking to shrink the business and focus primarily on serving existing customers. I mean... So I wouldn't be too surprised with this result. If you are, if you were at Wells Fargo and a lender, you know, a lending officer, maybe you should have moved on 